Here. Councilmember Hernandez. Councilmember Hernandez is currently absent. Councilmember Padilla. Here. And Councilmember Rodriguez. Councilmember Rodriguez is also currently absent. So we have three members on a quorum. Thank you so much, Mr. Espinosa. Great, so uh, today we have a somewhat light agenda, although very important issues will be discussed today. Uh, we have a report back coming from the Office of Wage Standards, and then three motions, uh, all related to uh, the very serious issue of, of wage theft. Um, my plan is to take up uh, items two through four uh, on one vote, uh, but if there's something that folks wanna pull that to have a much, um, sorry, have a separate vote or have a longer discussion on the item, please let me know. Uh, and with that, can we please have the clerk read the instructions for a public comment? Or sorry, the city, city attorney. City attorney, there you go. City attorney can read the public comments. Public. When it is your turn to speak, please state your name and which of the agenda items you would like to speak on. You will have one minute to speak on one agenda item or two minutes to speak on multiple items. In addition, you will have one minute if you wish to speak on general public comment. We will inform you when your time is up. When speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you are not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell whether you are speaking on an agenda item, you will get one brief warning from the city attorney or the chair. If you do not immediately get clearly on topic, or if you stray off topic, you will forfeit the rest of your time, and we will move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Aubrey. Um, and can we please have uh, that read in, uh, or said out loud in, in Spanish, please? Muy buenas tardes a todos. Si desean hacer un comentario público, por favor, pueden, eh, se tienen que ajustar a la agenda del, uh, o al punto de la agenda en el cual quieren hablar. Van a tener uh, la oportunidad de hacerlo. Y si quieren hacer comentario público, Eh, también lo, puede, lo pueden hacer y si hacen el, el comentar eh, si están haciendo sus comentarios pero no están hablando acerca del punto de la agenda se les avisará una vez y de lo y si no están hablando sobre ese punto y se les va a volver a informar y si no lo hacen entonces van a perder el tiempo que les queda y vamos a llamar a otra persona a uh, para que pase al micrófono gracias muchas gracias uh, Great. So uh, we'll now go into uh, public comment. Uh, Mr. Medehad Carr will be leading us on that. If you could please just call uh, three names at a time and have folks uh, be prepared to give a public comment. Absolutely. Uh, yes. Uh, so the first three names are uh, Antonio Dominguez, Daniel Jefferson, and Ernesto Hidalgo. Can you state your name and the items you'd like to speak on? Mi nombre es Antonio Dominguez y estoy aquí para apoyar a, a ustedes que aprueben las acciones 2, 3 y 4 en su agenda de comité y comentario general. I am here. My name is Antonio Dominguez and I'm here in support of the points. Uh, ¿Cuáles son los 2, 3? 2, 3 y 4. 2, 3 and 4. Cuando hagas su comentario público, si por favor puede hablar en uh, frases cortas para permitir la interpretadora que uh, repita lo que usted diga y luego usted habla, luego ella habla, usted habla y ella habla y hasta que lleguemos el, al tiempo. Le vamos a dar más tiempo para poder hablar. Okay. Okay, gracias. Uh, sí, como dije, mi nombre es Antonio Domínguez. Eh, Soy un trabajador de la industria del car wash y he venido aquí para dar un testimonio. Like I said, my name is Antonio uh, Rodriguez and I uh, work at a car wash and I'm here to give my testimony. De cómo las injusticias ha hecho en mi vida, ha hecho mi vida muy difícil. Injusticias que a lo largo de mi vida como trabajador he pasado como son robo de salario. I want to talk about injustices. I have suffered injustices at my workplace. And I would like to, uh, specifically with wage uh, theft. Represalias, maltratos laborales, y nos han llevado a pasar situaciones tan difíciles para mí y para nuestras familias. We haven't been treated with respect, and this has caused a lot of pain to me and my family. 
ha sido una desigualdad económica muy difícil para todos nosotros los trabajadores en Los Ángeles. There is inequity in the uh, social uh, and social issues in the county of Los Angeles. Creo que es tiempo de cambiar las cosas y la ciudad de Los Ángeles debería tomar liderazgo en enforzar todas las leyes en contra de estos abusos. And I think it's time that we can we stop this and the city of Los Angeles should be uh, at, uh, should be at the head of uh, making these changes. Y usar su poder para asegurar que el robo de salario sea cosa del pasado. Please use the power that you have so that the witch theft will be a thing of the past. Y por eso estamos aquí como prueba de, como, de que todas estas acciones nos han hecho una vida muy difícil y una desigualdad económica enorme. Like I said, this has been very difficult in our lives and this only shows the inequities. Nosotros solo queremos trabajar dignamente y poder llevar pan a la mesa de nuestras familias y parar todo esto. We just want to work. We just want to work and get respect and to have a, uh, uh, the means to bring food to our families. Y que la ciudad de Los Ángeles nos dé una mejor calidad de vida, muy digna y sin abusos ni robos de salario. We want to work in Los Angeles. We want to have quality of life. We want to have a, a dignified place of work. Ahora he aprendido a luchar por mis derechos laborales y por eso estoy aquí con mi testimonio de que se deberían cambiar y enforzar y que la ciudad de Los Ángeles, como dije, tome liderazgo y cambie nuestra calidad de vida a toda la clase trabajadora. I have learned to fight for my rights as a worker and I'm here to ask you to help us to put this in the past so that we can have a quality of life in the city of Los Angeles. Please take the leadership. No más abusos, no más represalias y sobre todo no más robo salarial. Gracias. No more abuse, no more reprisals and no more wage theft. Thank you. Muchas gracias, señora Domínguez, por su comentario. Hello, my name is Daniel Jefferson, and I'm here to speak in support of items two, three, and four. Great, you have two minutes for the items and one for, wait, or, or three, yeah, two minutes for the items. All right, cool, that's good. Um, I'm the policy analyst with the Filipino Workers Center. We're a nonprofit organization that organizes, educates, and mobilizes workers in the immigrant Filipino community with a focus on caregivers. Our members are an important part of the healthcare system, and they really provide critical care to LA seniors. Um, but they'll sometimes work over 24 hour shifts and well below minimum wage with no overtime. Um, it's, it can be a really difficult process to uh, build up the courage to uh, file a claim and we support item two because we believe it will help move towards a more cohesive and holistic uh, approach to labor enforcement um, to give them that kind of like unitary approach that our workers deserve. In regards to item three, um, we support it as well um, to help with the fact that our, our workers sometimes have to wait in between uh, when wage theft is, um, happens and when, it, uh, when they might get their compensation back. And during that time, they have to pay for expenses like housing, and we know that uh, loss of income can lead to homelessness, which is a major issue in our city. Um, and we work in a lot of cases where this happens, where hundreds of workers uh, with one employer will be paid $3, $6 an hour uh, with no overtime. And uh, in closing, I, we just really want to thank the chair as well as Councilman McCosker for getting this started and making LA uh, more labor enforcement uh, stronger, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Jefferson, for your comments. Good morning, council members. Uh, Ernesto Hidalgo, I will be speaking on items two, three, four, and general public comment. Great, you have two minutes for the items and one for general public comment. 
Thank you. It's an honor to be here today on behalf of the Los Angeles Worker Center Network. We are nine different uh, nonprofit or, or worker organizations. Seven of them are uh, engaged with specific uh, work industries that include low wage workers that are generally ununionized. The other two include Los Angeles, uh, the UCLA Labor Center and Bedza DAC. Um, and today we wanted to highlight to you that Angelinos are victims of $1.4 billion in wage theft each year according to a study by UCLA, uh, which makes Los Angeles the wage theft capital of our country. Uh, with wage theft more than 20% as prevalent in Los Angeles as compared to New York City or the city of Chicago. Um, and loss of income um, has been identified now as the number one driver of homeless of our homelessness crisis. That doesn't mean that um, all of homelessness is attributed to wage theft. I want to clarify that. I had a, an attorney texting me about that yesterday, um, but it, it clearly is a form of loss of income to our most vulnerable population, um, and that's that's the critical uh, fact. Um, and so, for that purpose, we wanted to uh, uh, be here today to support. Uh, these critical items, two, three, and four, and achieve the goals of providing workers with unitary enforcement so there is no wrong door when a worker comes to the city for help, um, to prioritize wage theft and labor violation claims by our city's most vulnerable workers, to provide prompt restitution to workers by partnering with the State Department of Industrial Relations, and finally, to identify what resources are necessary for us here in the city for proper enforcement and implementation of these measures. Thank you kindly for your consideration today. Thank you so much, Mr. Hidalgo, for your comments. Uh, I will call three more names. Uh, Olga Tirado, Norma Reyes, and Herman. We called uh, Norma Reyes, Olga Tirado, and Herman. Can you state your name and the items you'd like to speak on? Uh, yeah, a dirty nigger, Herman. And I'm talking about the wages of theft. You know, when Jose Luis Huizar was a councilman, those wages, oh, okay, so, excuse me, sir, but I got the floor. I'm speaking one minute, all items and non-agenda public comment. Two minutes on the items and one for general total, public correct? comment. Is that correct? Please start his time. Thank you, asshole. So, going back to this wage theft, when Jose Luis Huizar, the boss, was fucking Francine Gazoy, those wages in return were fucking your chef, chief deputy chief chief staff. The public pays for that when it's wages stolen and you're stealing it from the public when an elected official fucks his staff. And that happened some years ago before the boss made me homeless, kicked me out on the street, and used all that cyber fraud fucking shit through Proton to fuck me over. And yes, Unices, we need current resources and staffing resources to find out why we're hiring these fucking pedophiles in these commissions and committees. Put Kevin DeLeon on a committee. Put goddamn Kevin DeLeon CD14 on a committee so we could prevent all these additional fucking wages and civil rights equity and by a matter of immigration, just right now that pink petty face fucking goat, that man, fucking kicked me out of the meeting, didn't give me time on consent because this is stick a to the sanctuary items, Herman? city. Immigration should be welcome to Los Angeles. You made it an immigration sanctuary city. <laughs> Bring all the fucking immigration here. We have plenty of housing. We have plenty of money. Fuck everything. Fuck you. And fuck the wages. Bring the immigrants here. You get an EBT card. You get first class treatment and you weren't even working here with a social security number, motherfuckers. How does that work, Soto? I'm a natural born citizen of the United States of America, 42 C, 1983, a white nigger, and I went through homelessness, I went through an EBT card, I went through Medi-Cal, <laughs> now into my general public comment. Yeah, you dirty niggers. 
Why is this happening only here in the state of California? Because that jackass, moron, stupid, incoherent president, Democrat, along with some Republicans, decided to say that it's okay to come to America illegally. No! People need to work. Build up the economy. And then you receive SSDI, SSI, SSS, whatever the fuck it is, Soto. You got that name. You were born with it. I was given a name as an American Native American Indian because my family came from Arizona naturally before your fucking Holocaust and your fucking crisis and your fucking homelessness made me homeless at one point in my life. So fuck you. For the members of the public who are here uh, you know, to engage in the civic process, uh, it's unfortunate that we have to put up with uh, this very uh, despicable speech uh, from, from this person, hate speech, let's call it what it is. Uh, unfortunately, they do this almost. This is your first and last warning, Herman. If you make another disruption, I will ask to be for you to leave. Uh, I, I apologize, but it's, you know, First Amendment rights. Sometimes we have to deal with these people. Okay, uh, next up. Uh, can you say your name and the items you'd like to speak on? Uh, buenas tardes, mi nombre es Olga Tirado. Hablo en apoyo del artículo 2, 3 y 4. Uh, trabajo para Flying Food. Per, per, perdón, uh, Olga. Olga Tirado. Sí. Okay. Olga Tirado, un momentito, por favor. Me dice dos oraciones y para, para que yo le pueda interpretar. Gracias. Ok. Comencemos. Ok. Trabajo en Flying Food cerca de LES. Mi nombre es, eh, mi empresa, elaboro alimentos para la aerolínea. My name is Olga Tirado and I work, I have a company and I provide services for an airline. Y soy un miembro orgulloso de Local 11 Unite Here. And I am a proud member of Local 11 Unite Here. Fui uno de los 150 trabajadores que se declararon en huelga durante 26 días. I, en I was one of the workers that went on strike for 26 days. Seguimos luchando por un contrato justo. We continue fighting so we can have a just contract. Que proporcione salarios con los que podamos vivir en Los Ángeles. We want a fair contract so we can have salaries that are, uh, we can live with. Desde el 2020 hemos tenido que presentar siete denuncias por robo de salario. Since 2020, we submitted a complaint for um, wage theft. Uh, contra Flying Food Group. Against Flying Food uh, Group. Y sus contratistas. And the subcontractors. Los trabajadores recién comenzaron a recibir pagos retroactivos por algunas de las de estas quejas este año. Some of the workers uh, are receiving retroactive pay this year. La ciudad ha ayudado a los trabajadores de las agencias de trabajos temporal. The city has also helped the temporary workers that work through an agency. A quienes se les debía dinero por tiempo que trabajaron como empleados. Como temporales. They were owed money for the time that they work as, as temporary workers. Trabajando in flying food, pero la mayoría de los trabajadores permanentes. But most of the permanent workers. Que se declararon en huelga como yo. That went on strike, just like me. Aún no han recibido pago atrasado por violaciones de salario digno. Have not received retroactive pay for wage theft. Cuando flying food no paga a los trabajadores. Lo que hemos ganado. Uh, when uh, Flying Foods does not pay the workers the, the money that we have earned, se vuelve imposible sobrevivir en Los Ángeles. It is impossible to live in Los Angeles. ¿Cómo podemos esperar que nuestra empresa avance, avance nuestro salario cuando ni siquiera se les obliga a pagar el mínimo? Que How se can les we expect to re receive a better pay when they don't even pay for the salaries that are owned? Muchas gracias por su atención. Thank you so much for your time. Muchas gracias, señora Tirado, por sus comentarios. Can we call up the last speaker, uh, Mr. Medekar? I think we have, uh, we have uh, uh, Victor Naro also uh, on the queue. A traducción en español, por favor. Uh, sí, señora. Buenas tardes a todos. 
Estoy hablando en apoyo del artículo 2, 3 y 4. Good afternoon, everyone. I am speaking on items 2, 3 and 4. Mi nombre es Norma Reyes y trabajo en Flying Food cerca de LAX. My name is Norma Reyes and I work at Flying Food at LAX. Mi compañía prepara alimentos para las aerolíneas y soy un orgulloso miembro de United Here Local 11. My company prepares food for the uh, airlines and I am a proud member of Local 11, Unite Here. Fui una de las 150 trabajadoras que salieron en huelga durante 26 días en abril. I was one of the 150 workers that went on strike uh, for 26 days in the month of April. Todavía estamos luchando por un contrato justo que proporcione salarios con los que podamos vivir en Los Ángeles. We are still fighting for a fair uh, contract for uh, livable wages. En nuestra experiencia como trabajadores de Flying Food Group, based on my experience as employee of uh, Flying Foods Group, la ciudad ha sido demasiado lenta y trabajadores estamos sufriendo. Uh, the city has been taking um, a long time to provide any support to the workers and we are uh, suffering. Los trabajadores de Flying Food presentaron una queja en julio 2020. The workers uh, uh, submitted a claim in the month of July 2020. Y tuvimos que esperar tres años para que la oficina de administración de contratos obligara a Flying Food Group a cumplir. So we had to wait three years for the office uh, of uh, administration of contracts to um, uh, uh, let them know that they had to uh, to abide by the contract. Es demasiado largo. That's way too long. Mientras tanto, hemos tenido que presentar otras denuncias. In the meantime, we have been submitting uh, more complaints. Denuncias salariales contra Flying Food Group. Against Flying Food uh, Group. Y sub subcontratistas. And subcontractors. Alegando que han seguido rompiendo la ley. Since they're still breaking the, lay, the, the, the law. Todavía estamos esperando que la ciudad investigue sus quejas. We're Estas still quejas. waiting for the city to investigate the claims that we submitted. No podemos esperar tres años para que la ciudad re responsabilice a Flying Food Group por el robo de salarios. We cannot wait another three years uh, for the city to, uh, for the city to intervene in this matter so that they do something about the wage theft. Muchas gracias por su atención. Thank you for your time. Muchas gracias, señora Reyes, por sus comentarios. Hi, good afternoon. I'm here to speak on items two, three, four, and general comments. Great, you have two minutes for the items and one for general public comment. Okay, good afternoon, council members. I hope everyone's doing well. My name is Victor Naro. I'm uh, Labor Studies Professor and Project Director for the UCLA Labor Center. On item number two, you know, I've been studying wage theft for 25 years um, to try to figure out solutions and strategies and, uh, and figure out a way to get a handle on some of these industries where you find the egregious wage theft. And um, I really come to realize coordination and communication is the key component to all of this. Um, you know, we talk about, you know, we always need more resources, but I think I look to the different departments, the stakeholders, we're all stakeholders, and the community organizations, the unions, um, and, you know, Office of uh, Civil and Human Rights and Equity Department, um, Bureau of Contract Enforcement Administration, but also uh, City Council and the Mayor's Office. We all need to coordinate and communicate so we can develop the flight strategies to finally get rid of waste debt in Los Angeles. On item three, you know, Governor Newsom did a report with the University of San Francisco, uh, UC San Francisco, where um, they held that loss of income is the number one reason why people are going homeless. Mm. Waste debt takes away the income of workers already living in poverty, um, and then they even gain minimum wage for the most part. So they're in a very vulnerable position, and my worry is that workers suffering waste up today are going to be the homeless for, of tomorrow. So that's why there's an urgency with this crisis. And on item number four, uh, I think the city attorney can and should do more. I know that um, District Attorney Gascon has been engaging in, 
in innovative uh, process to file waste uh, dev cases, but I think the city attorney should get more involved and really uh, di dive deeper with all of us to uh, address the crisis of waste dev. And my general comment is really, there's no substitute for coordination, partnership, and communication. So I think the more we do that, the more effective we'll be in our strategies to eradicate waste theft. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Naro, for your work, your tireless work over the generations. And uh, you know, I, I, I speak for this body that uh, you know, <coughs> you talked about this issue when it was not popular, and, and, and we've come a long way. So I just want to thank you for your many years of service. Okay, uh, do we have any, um, any other folks uh, on public comment? Uh, that is all the uh, speakers. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Manerkar. Uh, can we please uh, go to, can we get the, can we, we'll close public comment, and can the clerk please read uh, item one for the record? Thank you. Item one is a verbal report from the Bureau of Contract Administration relative to the Bureau's goals and recent initiatives. Excellent. Do we have anybody from uh, the Bureau to speak on this? Do we have a report back? Good afternoon. Uh, do, would you mind just uh, stating your name so everyone knows who you are and uh, your title, please? And then we'll hear from you on the report. Well, good afternoon. Um, Council members, my name is John Reamer. I'm your Inspector of Public Works. I'm the Director of the Bureau of Contract Administration. And I thank you for this opportunity to come and share with you today. Um, the public comment is always insightful as it uh, sheds light on issues for us to hear. And wage theft is something that has been around for a while. And to all those who came and spoke today, I applaud them for the courage of coming and publicly sharing their thoughts. Uh, my goal here today is to give you some insight as to who the Bureau of Contract Administration happens to be and, and our relationship with this um, issue, wage theft. Um, we're one of the five active bureaus in the Department of Public Works. We have two primary areas of responsibility. One is compliance and the other is inspection. Today I'm going to focus on a portion of the compliance piece for you. I've handed out for the members um, a brief outline as to the things that I'm going to go over with you, uh, but certainly if you have any questions, feel free to pause me and, and I'd rather this be a conversation than, than a monologue. Um, the notion of wage theft, let me first say that we in the Bureau of Contract Administration, we've been doing this for over 50 years now. and. It could not happen without, as Mr. Uh, Naro just said, and I, I take my hat off also to Victor. Um, he's been fighting this for a long time. But you need partnerships. And for the Bureau of Contract Administration, our partner is the Office of the City Attorney. Uh, Danya Manassi is here um, to assist me, and I, I may call on her, but it is a phenomenal partnership, and it is priceless to say the least. It's definitely important. Uh, back in 1991, our Office of Contract Compliance was established. It was created by city ordinance. And one of the tasks was to uh, investigate wage violations, specifically prevailing wage violation, and enforce compliance of city, state, and federal laws. When it comes to wage theft, there are three wages that I will be addressing. One is prevailing wage, where we at the Bureau of Contract Administration, we address this in our regulatory powers as an arm of the state of California. And what I mean by that is even though we're a city department, the state of California back in 2000 officially affirmed us as a certified labor compliance program. That means that for all construction that is done in the city of Los Angeles, awarded construction, we are empowered to receive certified payrolls and launch investigations where necessary where wage theft occurs. Um, we are one of four agencies in the state outside of the um, Division of Labor Standards Enforcement under the Department of Industrial Relations. We are one of the four legacy agencies that have that affirmation. Uh, we are the only agency in the state of California that has been affirmed by the DLSE to enforce apprenticeship violations. So outside of the state, our Bureau of Contract Administration we're the only agency that is empowered to do that. And we take great pride in that because we recognize 
the importance of ensuring opportunities for, for men and women. Um, in our course of having this, if you will, responsibility, um, we've done a number of things. We've created a joint labor compliance monitoring program where we've partnered with industry experts, those partners outside of the city to actually help us in our enforcement efforts. We started this back in 2007. Um, we uh, initiated a labor compliance officer coalition where quarterly people from all over the state, quite frankly, um, both state, local, federal uh, agencies, they come and we meet and we talk about the issues surrounding um, wage theft. So that's prevailing wage. In 1997, this council uh, affirmed the living wage order. And in 2004, that responsibility was given back to the BCA to serve as a designated administrative agency. Um, with living wage, we address that under our proprietary uh, powers, making sure that where we have service contracts, men and women that operate under those contracts are paid an identified wage that we have in the ordinance, both for the labor compliance piece, as I shared with you in the document, we have 30 uh, authorized positions, uh, five vacancies currently. And for living wage, we have seven authorized positions for vacancies currently. I mentioned living wage and prevailing wage because they served to establish the foundation upon which the city family decided not only did it want to enforce minimum wage, but who would be chosen to do that. And coming to the Bureau of Contract Administration, I don't think was uh, something that it was a let's take a try. Um, our years of experience in enforcing wage issues, it did make sense. Not only because of our relationship with the issue, but also because of our relationship with individuals in the community, um, both personal and professional. Knowing our commitment to this and seeing our background and willingness to do this. So in 2016, the Office of Wage Standards was created placed inside of the Bureau of Contract Administration. Um, once again, initially the goal was to investigate minimum wage violations along with paid sick time benefits um, to be afforded to all individuals working in the city of LA. Now here's the difference between minimum wage and prevailing and living wage. The big huge difference is that we do not enjoy the leverage, which I'll speak to later, on the minimum wage side as we do with prevailing wage and living wage. And the reason why is because with both prevailing wage and living wage, we have a contractual relationship with the contractor. They are contracting with the city to perform work and we pay them for the work that they do. So it's easy to say, yes, we want you as part of your contractual obligation to compensate at this rate. In the state of California on the prevailing wage, they've said the same thing. Any work that's being done where you're receiving public monies, this is the rate you will pay. On a federal level, it's referred to as Davis-Bacon. The city said, we want to establish a minimum wage and we want to ensure that any business inside of the geographical footprint of the city of Los Angeles will at a minimum pay the workers the wage that we identify. The challenge for us is we have no contractual relationship with these businesses. They don't know who we are from a can of paint. The obligation to do anything in the beginning was, who are you, why are you here, what do you want? And even though they may have been, should have been, familiar with the topic of minimum wage from a state perspective, from a city perspective, that was foreign to many of the businesses. So ours was to figure out how to address this issue. What approach would we take to make sure that um, we maintain a level playing field, not presuming anything, but making sure that businesses the employer and those employees both were um, given a fair opportunity to deliver a service and to receive compensation for work provided. So ours was to put a lot of effort and energy into outreach and education, and, and we did that. Now, some history with respect to minimum wage, it is our regulatory powers. Um, and once again, I cannot speak enough about the assistance that we receive from the office of the city attorney. They are tremendous in enabling us to do the things that we do because since the Office of Wage Standards, we have added to minimum wage 
fair chance hiring, hotel worker protection, citywide hotel worker minimum wage, fair work week, freelance worker protection, and quite possibly healthcare worker minimum wage ordinance that's going to be on a March referendum more than likely. So a number of ordinances have come to this office around the issue of wage. And again, I could, I could speak a long time on this and, uh, and, I, and I don't want to burden you with that, but it's critically important for us to hear what's being said and recognize the importance of this unfortunate reality of wage theft. In our Office of Wage Standards, we started with five. We're up to 44 authorized positions, but we have 29 vacancies, mm. which I will speak to. Yeah, you said 29. How are you able to do anything? Yeah, my staff asked that question as well. And as I mentioned staff, there's a name that I have to bring up. She's not here today because uh, she's celebrating a special day tomorrow, but her name is Kimberly Fitzpatrick. She's been with the office at the very beginning, and she does a phenomenal job in presenting what we have as our Office of Wage Standards. Um, our goal was to perform outreach through a combination of both direct staff outreach and multimedia. We wanted to use anything and everything we could, from bus benches to newspapers to um, print media to radio, um, to strategically get the message out so that everyone and anyone who could and would hear would know what's expected. We wanted the employer to know this is what the city needs you to do. And we wanted the employees, the workers to know this is what you should expect. Because for many of them, they did not, they did not know. Um, we had posters printed in 13 different languages. Um, we have, when we did the radio stations, um, five different languages. With respect to community newspapers, nine different languages. Um, we have a hotline, um, 844 Wages LA. We have several staff members that are bilingual. Um, we've lost some, we're trying to get them back. Because ours is to make sure that we touch every single aspect of our city to make sure that all who need to can know. Um, we were empowered to have a uh, community contract. It's a pre-qualified on-call list. We currently are getting ready to start, um, which would be our third time we have seven consultants on board, and they help us outreach to both businesses, those employers, and the workers um, to ensure that the message is going out. We've paid over $500,000 to consultants in helping us partner to do this. Um, we've reached out to over 120,000 employers and 119,000 workers. It's been a balanced attack to make sure that the word gets out and people hear it. Um, our current budget is roughly $438,000 for our outreach efforts. Huh. Um, is that enough? Many would say it's not, but we do the best we can with, with what we have. Um, since 2016, when the Office of Wage Standards started, uh, we've responded to over 25,000 inquiries uh, in roughly a third of the working day to get back to those who call us. We've attended over 102 events. We've performed over 1,500 intake complaints. We've had 675,000 uh, visits by the public to our website. Uh, we've contacted over 2,900 employers uh, over the phone because we outreach to them as well. And this is something that you will find quite interesting. Um, of the 15 council districts, five of them lead the pack. And that's not necessarily something to be proud of, but it's a reality for us. Uh, council districts 14, 5, 13, 6, and 10 with respect to complaints. And what we've done in response to that is um, we give more attention, if you will, to those council districts where we have a, a higher number of complaints. So the notion of intake, um, it's important to us. Wanting to hear and receive the information, we totally get that there is a reluctance, and we've learned this from our days in handling prevailing wage, to complain. A worker is not apt to want to complain. Why is that? Because of fear of getting fired. We understand that. And so the more we can go out to where the workers are and find them, that helps. On the prevailing wage side, all businesses know, all contractors know, we're going to interview workers. We don't necessarily have that luxury 
on the minimum wage side. The businesses in the city of Los Angeles, they are not obligated to set aside time for us to come out and interview workers unless there is a reason, unless there's a complaint. But if there is no complaint, then how do we know to go and do that? So for many, the term of strategic enforcement has been used quite frequently lately. And I'm, I'm gonna speak to that in a minute, but I, I wanna put out there the importance of being able to get the information to the workers and have an avenue for the workers to be able to come and share. That's part of why we wanted to have the community uh, contract, so that we could have individuals. And, and when we did our first cohort, our first round, we had many representatives from um, worker networks that partnered with us because they knew where to go That's and right. they knew who to talk to. Right. And so we wanted to, when I say take advantage of, I think you can appreciate what I'm saying, we wanted to utilize that and, and benefit from that so that we could find out um, where the complaints were coming from. Not to mention you had employers that would threaten their employees to tell anybody. If you tell somebody and I find out, then this is gonna be the consequence. So we, we recognized that it was a delicate moment. Coupled with the fact that when our office opened up, <clears throat> national leadership was such that um, many people were afraid to come to a governmental agency and, and share a concern. And so we, we recognized these were the many things that we had in, in front of us. Um, our goal was to, when we investigated, Thanks. we would investigate the entire business. Why is that? If you come to me and you file a complaint, and I go to your employer and I say, I want to see the records of this person, they know exactly who came and complained. Right. Yeah. So to protect the, uh, the person, the identity of the person, we would investigate the whole organization. We would ask for payrolls for everyone, knowing who we wanted to look at but we did not want to let anyone know that this is the person that came to us because we were really sensitive to making sure that there was no chance of retaliation. One might argue that took a little longer, but at the same time, we figured if there's a little smoke here, more than likely right. others who haven't come also have some concerns. So ours was to investigate from a, a neutral fact-finding approach, um, looking at the facts to make sure that we did not miss anything. Um, we do have penalties that we can enforce, uh, $120 a day or $50 a day uh, for the employees. <clears throat> and what we typically do is we'll receive a, a complaint. We will check to make sure that there's merit to the complaint. In other words, is there something here that warrants an investigation? And then we will begin our investigation, uh, asking for records. We are empowered in the ordinance to require employers to provide us documentation so that we can make sure that we have the information that we, um, that we need. Um, from, a from a strategic standpoint, um, we have done five proactive investigations in the life of OWS, one of which was a joint investigation with the Department of Labor. So we recognize the importance and the value of partnerships. And again, part of that comes from our experience and our time as a labor compliance program where we have a joint labor compliance monitoring program. We recognize that many hands can make much lighter work. So the more we can involve, um, the better. When we find businesses that have violated the ordinance, uh, what we do also is we place them in a pool and we randomly go through and we perform audits. So as to make sure that, okay, we were wrong, we get that. We're not gonna do it again. We appreciate that, but we're gonna come back and check. And, and we've done 17 of those as well. Um, some facts, uh, we currently have 162 uh, open cases. Um, over uh, the year of the office, we have solved 558 cases 189 of them with violations. You might say, well, 558, but why only 189 with violations? When we first started, there were many people who came to us not knowing that you're actually in L.A. County, you're not in L.A. City, so we couldn't help them. So many of the complaints that came to us, unfortunately, had merit, but we weren't empowered to do anything with them. <clears throat> Some of the complaints that may have come to us 
weren't solely minimum wage. Some of them may have been overtime. Some of them may have been meal or rest breaks that we weren't empowered to do anything with that you currently have a motion to address that. So that, that's something that will be dealt with. We've collected over $800,000 in restitution that's gone straight back to the workers. Um, over $1.5 million in a value of paid sick leave time, roughly 145,000 hours of paid sick leave time that workers would not have received that they were able to get because of our office. $540,000 in fines that came to the city and workers. And over 8,000 workers that have been impacted by wage theft, we were able to provide restitution and penalties for them. Um, our processing time right now is 534 days. Somebody spoke to <coughs> the length of time. Um, unacceptable. Um, our goal is to begin and end an investigation within 365 days. And when we were fully staffed, we were doing that. Um, but you've already heard me allude to the fact that roughly right now we have a 60% vacancy rate. So that makes it a little difficult for us to address the cases as quickly as we would like to. You may be wondering where are some of the violations occurring? Um, roughly 23% of the violations happen in areas that we refer to as professional or occupational areas, such as <clears throat> security work, construction, delivery work, a catch-all. Um, the second area would be restaurants. 20% of the violations happen in the restaurant industry and 14% in the retail industry. Mm -hmm. Now, there will be some that will say, hold on, John, you're missing your stats because there are a lot of violations in the garment industry. Absolutely, there are. Um, we're believing that we don't receive all of the complaints because the state of California, they have a, a special agency, a, a special task force, if you will, solely for the garment industry. And we're believing many of the complaints that may have come to us will go to them um, because of what they're able uh, to do in the garment industry. Um, a SWOT analysis that I provided for you with respect to our strengths and our weaknesses. Um, when we are fully staffed, uh, there's no one that does it better than us with respect to turnaround time from investigation received to restitution provided. And even with the number that I gave you, um, not to throw rocks at any other agency in the state, we're still the fastest. You might say, well, that's unfortunate because that's sad. It is sad. 530 days and you're the fastest. Um, many agencies are dealing with the same thing we are with respect to being able to have enough staff. Um, the way we prioritize our cases, um, we want to make sure that the workers receive restitution first and then penalties if necessary, which means what? Um, we've been able to work with a number of employers, not to villainize, but to carefully communicate and explain what happened, what needs to happen. And we found that instead of that employer wanting to go the route of a hearing, which they could, they're willing to restitute and we get the money into the hands of the workers a lot sooner. Um, and then the partnership, both internal and external, is also a strength. And again, I'm going to mention the Office of the City Attorney. Um, we are able to do what we do because of the very close relationship, as well as many that are behind me, many worker networks that we meet with on a regular basis from the beginning until now. Um, they help us see and know where to go, uh, and we really want to continue to grow that. Uh, weaknesses would be there is a steep learning curve, uh, coupled with our high vacancy rate and turnover, um, to be able to really get this. Uh, because there are some businesses, without me mentioning any names, that are sad, sorry, and trifling. I said that. They are sad, sorry, and trifling, and they do not care about the workers. And they are willing to fight. They're not willing to automatically say, oh, we're sorry, we messed up, we'll pay. And so in order for us to make sure that we are effective and we are successful, we have to know what we're doing. And that takes time it, to make sure that we're dotting I's and crossing T's. Um, in the words of John Wooden, be quick but don't rush. Ours is to make sure that we get it done quickly, but we don't rush and miss something. So yes, we have peer review. We make sure that our investigations are solid and sound. And hopefully we don't have to turn it over to the city attorney because if we do, that means we're going to a hearing. 
and we're going to a hearing because an employer says, I'm not going to pay. You're going to have to make me pay. We've had employers say, we don't believe that you are authorized to come into our office. We don't believe you're authorized to ask for this material. We're not going to give it to you. And so it doesn't come as easily as we would like for it to, but we do get it done. Um, the backlog that I alluded to, which is also a weakness, I mentioned the fact that uh, our 29 vacancies, that's roughly over 60% of our Office of Wage Standards. So it's, 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 it's a weakness that we have, but opportunity is also in that acronym SWAT. Um, we are enjoying right now some aggressive and creative hiring. And I want to thank the city family. I want to take my hat off to the, the personnel department um, and the mayor's office and all those who've assisted. Um, one of the things that we did was we transitioned over to some new classifications that we did not have before. One is special investigator and another that's in the works right now, investigator trainee. Trainee, yes. The thought behind that, quite frankly, is that many people that are behind me and that have seen you that know this well, why not bring them on board as part of the city family? Um, and so we've created a class that they can come into. And these are individuals that want to do this. So we're believing that that will help stem the tide of some of our turnover. Um, we currently have 10 special investigators. Well, we have six now. We're bringing four on board. And we really believe that that's going to help us tremendously. Um, the expansion with respect to overtime and meal breaks and rest breaks, it's going to help us be more uh, comprehensive in our wage step issues. So right now, we only do minimum wage. And if there is an overtime issue or a rest break or a meal break issue, we have to turn it over to the state. Um, that probably is going to change soon. But that, that is an opportunity that we will all benefit from. Partnering with other agencies and continue to expand the partnership. You heard me speak to Joint Labor Compliance Monitoring Program in our city capacity. Can that happen in this environment where it's regulatory power? I believe it can. Maybe not in the same way, but I believe it can. And, and we're having discussions about that. And then ultimately, in the opportunity, our re reorganizing how we look as an agency with respect to all the many tasks that we've been given. Um, ours is to really look hard at creating a new division that will enable us to effectively allocate resources. Let me close with the threats. Um, one threat is a failure to appreciate the detrimental impact that profits over people has. That is a mindset, that is an attitude that unfortunately exists. There are many who will say, we need to get it done. We'll worry about the wages later. Be it prevailing or living or minimum wage, there are those who put profit over people. That needs to be taken care of. And this body, all of council, the mayor's office, all of us making this an issue, the voices that you heard speak before I came before you today, making this an issue, we cannot afford to disrespect those individuals that are doing the work. That is a threat. Insufficient resources with respect to training and what we need to be able to effectively combat wage theft. The stats that you heard from the public testimony are very real. I mean, this is prevailing. And you have to ask yourself the question, how could it be? Because right now, it's allowed. Many businesses believe that it's easier to get caught and pay restitution than it is to pay people up front. Right. And that is an approach that they take. So ours has to be to let it be known in the city of LA, waste theft is not going to happen. And we're committed to ensuring that it does not happen by putting the resources in place to do what needs to be done. And that's the last part. Our inability to enhance partnerships and maintain a trained, dedicated team, well versed in the many paths that lead to waste theft, is also a threat. And as we build our team, and we are, and the city attorney as well, and our partnerships continue to grow and enhance, I believe that we can stem the tide of wage theft. I really do. It's not just me saying that because I'm in front of you today. I've been doing this for a number of years. This can happen, but it starts with us telling everyone wage theft is not going to happen in the city of Los Angeles. Great. Thank you so much for your wonderful, thoughtful, and impassioned report. Uh, I think. Uh, 
I was very captivated by your eloquence and your detail um, and really appreciate the history of how this office has formed over the years, you know, from going from prevailing to, uh, you know, ordinances and, and how the, it's, to me it's fascinating stuff. Um, but clearly, uh, you know, you laid out the, the strengths and challenges and I, I think, you know, I want to applaud the work that you and your, your team are doing. Uh, and you know, hope that this this body can be a partner uh, to you know all the things you identify that we can improve, so we can we can uh, move forward, make it you know, unacceptable to be here and uh, to do wage theft in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, I have a few questions, and then I'll pass it over to my colleagues. Um, I was really uh, very happy to hear that um, that the groups are being involved in the investigate, like in in helping you investigate. Uh, you know, in you know, in, in Council District 13, we have a ton of nonprofits that are already doing the work, right? They have the connections with the Philippine community, with the South Asian community. Um, but it sounds like you're utilizing a lot of that, but what, what would you say are some of the, the, the biggest obstacles? I know it's a very broad question, but some of the biggest obstacle, uh, obstacles in, in, in trying to fight wage theft. Uh, the biggest obstacle is fear, quite frankly. Um, Many employees have been um, made to be very afraid of saying anything about mistreatment uh, by the employer. Um, and because they need a job, the unfortunate reality is that $8 an hour is better than no dollar an hour. And that's unfortunate, that, that's sad. We need to overcome that. And the notion of I mean, there have been several campaigns, the clean car wash campaign, the notion of celebrating those businesses that do it right and that do it well. And we as a city taking the lead in that and identifying those businesses that they are committed to doing this. They recognize that it's important to, I'm going to use the word, invest in our workforce. Employers don't survive without employees. It just doesn't happen. This is a hand in glove relationship. And once that appreciating and respect is there, then it goes a long way in to be able to root out those employers that are taking advantage of workers. So the one is, is, is fear. Um, that's why the partnership is so important, as you alluded to community-based organizations. And there are many that are out there doing the work. And it's ours to see how we can better uh, connect in utilizing what they bring to us. We were talking about this the other day uh, amongst our team. And I use the acronym of uh, CERT. Many people know it, but they know it from an emergency standpoint, community emergency response training. Why wouldn't we want to do that when it comes to economic? Why wouldn't we want to share with the community the things that we need to see as an agency? So until we're able to get there, you can gather this information for us. We'll give you a checklist of what we need. You provide it to us, and that helps us go forward. We're not there yet where they go all the way with us through the, the uh, investigation piece. Um, there are regulatory concerns that we still need to iron out, but there are many things that can be done in the preparatory piece that can assist us, because it's going to take all of us. One agency or three agencies, be it the DOL or the DLSC or OWS, won't stop wage theft. This is going to be a community effort. Yeah. It, you know, it, it sounds to me very uh, similar to uh, my previous job when we would ask people to, to join the union, right? That's like, they, they have to take a step, a courageous step to say, I want to do this. And many times uh, the fear stops people from doing that, even though they know that's probably the best thing to do for their lives. I, I like the idea of uh, anonymity. Uh, you know, people can say, report something anonymously and then you come in and, and you know, talk to the whole staff as opposed to just one person. I think that compels people to come. Obviously, the education piece, sometimes people don't know what is wage theft, right, uh, I think is important. And then uh, there's one other one I was, I was thinking about. Uh, but is there, is there other things that you can identify that are similar to that, that perhaps we could be more, more helpful in, in getting more folks forward? Uh, I, I would love a campaign that right. bill, bill, billboards everywhere saying, stop wage theft. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's right. just... Oh, the, I remember the, the darkness one. and the silence allows it to continue. Yeah, 
Yeah. And, and, and dare, I, dare I get on a soapbox and talk about greed? I don't, I don't want to do that. That's too easy for me to do that. Um, but this has to be, again, I'm back to the respect for the worker. We, we have men and women that work hard. I mean, they, they work hard for, for the benefits of this community, <laughs> this city, this country. And for them not to be compensated is just criminal. And so for all of the agencies that are empowered to do something about this, from ours to the city attorney, we're saying yes, let's do this. Right, right. Yeah, and I think, I think the other thing that uh, I forgot to mention or just a few seconds ago is that the relation, like you can't underestimate the relationships, right? Like if, uh, you know, I met with Thai CDC the other day and they have folks that were previously, uh, you know, victims of, of, uh, of human trafficking, labor trafficking, mm -hmm. right? And so they, they understand that. They, under, they know how to talk to folks, right? They're talking to the Thai community. And so I think when, when I hear a lot of the, the sort of challenges, I think it's going to be very key for the, 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 the nonprofit partners to just, because that's a place where people trust, right? Like when people think of yeah. the Black Worker Center, the, the, the black workers, like this is an institution that they don't have any sense of distrust. I, I, and, and I think about that because simple, certainly for the immigrant population, right? You know, all these rumors went out from the federal government saying, you know, if, if you know, it could cause deportations, uh, you know, public charge. And so folks became more distrustful of the government entity as a result of hearing that in the news. But they wouldn't be distrustful of, uh, of a Thai CDC or a Black Worker Center or a Filipino Worker Center, right? They don't view those organizations, uh, they view them in, like as a safe haven, right? And I think that's... Um, we're never going to stop the 100% of the violations, but if we can make it easier for folks uh, to feel like they can trust the institution, right? I think it's it can help overcome some of that fear. I mean, that's sort of like the the gist that I'm getting from a lot of the testimony that you're giving. Council member, you you have my word that John Reamer definitely does not have a problem with and welcomes partnerships. Yeah. Because I totally agree with you. I agree with you on a personal basis. I get the fact that, you know what, my children, they'll go to my wife first because they feel that she'll listen <laughs> <laughs> and then she'll bring it to me. And, and it's not that they don't want to come to dad, and John but they don't feel play, more comfortable why. talking to mom. I got some moms in here saying amen on that one. I <laughs> yeah, I know. No, and, and I think the, the last thing I would say is, uh, is, is we also have to make, uh, in a, you know, make example of companies and celebrate the wins. I think when you, you have a win and you celebrate that win, uh, it inspires other people to, to come forward and say, you know, that I, I can win too. People like to win, right? Uh, I'll open up for questions from any of my colleagues. Uh, if you have any, uh, see Council Member Padilla. Hello, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm excited to see a whole, uh, a whole agenda dedicated to the improvements of how to, you know, make your department uh, stronger and serve better. I really, really appreciate the SWOT analysis in your presentation. Uh, really helps to really understand the weaknesses, the strengths, and you know where we can go. Um, and I appreciate the timeline as well. And going back to 2016, you know that was an era when I was running in and out of this building to help make sure that this um, office was put together as part of the raising the minimum wage campaign to 15, and talking about sick days and how it pertains to our low wage workers in the city. So it's nice to see uh, where we've come, you know, so many years later. However, in your uh, report, one of the terms, or I know you kind of alluded to it, I know uh, Mr. Soto Martinez just alluded to it, was I vividly remember, um, and I'm reminded by some of the people in the crowd, that one of the big components of what was uh, discussed was creating community contracts and having community contracts as a partnership with organizations like Clean Car Wash, um, Filipino Worker Center, Black Worker Center, uh, you know, and, and um, because we know that some of the victims of wage theft are not necessarily ready to go speak to, you know, a government entity, but rather prefer to go to an organization that they've already built the trust with. So as we, um, you know, vote on all of these items related to also working with the city attorney and whatnot, uh, I'm curious, where are we with continuing to use community contracts? Do you feel like you does that need to continue? How can we continue it? And do you see it as a critical component to um, 
improving the amount of people that we can service? Most certainly. We are continuing on page three. I, I give a little breakdown. Um, I don't want to mention all the names, but we have okay, seven. Also, can you speak into the microphone? I can oh, barely hear you. I'm sorry. On, on page three of the, of the document that I gave you, it, it gives a brief snapshot of where we are in our current um, on-call list. We have seven consultants. I would love to have more, and it's, uh, but, we, but we have the seven, and we, we can reopen that um, if, if, if necessary. The partnership with the community uh, is it's priceless for what you just said. And I do recall in the early days of the campaign, Raise the Wage, um, again, the community will know where to and who to and when to far better than we will. Um, serving as that interpreter, if you will, for our being able to get the information. Um, so to answer your question, yes, we are committed to this. We will continue to do this. This is not a, 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 a transitioning away from. Um, the city family as a whole ran into some economic challenges, and so the initial number that we had in our first year, it reduced a little bit, but we are continuing to elevate the issue. In our budget request, we will also do that in this upcoming year uh, because we value this partnership. Also, um, well, thank you, and as a follow-up, in your um, budget requests, will you be able to um, showcase potentially funding in a way that allows for worker centers or partners from all over the city of Los Angeles to make sure that there's not, you know, like a concentration of service providers in one part of Los Angeles, but also, you know, potentially having somebody that takes us on in the San Fernando Valley? Because I wouldn't be able to tell you today who services um, individuals in my part of in my district. Yeah, what we typically do is, and I would love to have a, 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 a more in-depth conversation with you, we will issue to those who are part of our list um, what we refer to as a task order solicitation. And we'll identify areas or issues that we believe needs attention. So the very first time we had the list, um, I think we did one for specifically for garment workers, and we did one specifically for car wash, and we did one specifically for uh, uh, restaurants, and because that represented who we had in in our pool. Um, so we are open to those, for lack of a better way of saying it, those hot spots that um, that have a lot of activity, unfortunately, or those areas that. Um, have not been addressed. We, we, are, we are open to that. Now, with respect to being able to put money into a, 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 a worker network, um, what I would suggest and what I would like to have is for those worker networks to be part of the community bench. And so that would make it a lot easier for us to be able to do that. Got it. Okay. Um, there's a, is there a way to maybe do it based on communities where we know there is a high concentration of low-wage workers? Well, let's, let's have the conversation. Okay. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's have the conversation. Um, I, I, I think we're, we, we, can, we can come up with some ways to, to address which that's the whole concept behind strategic enforcement. The mm -hmm. notion of identifying, be it a sector, or an area that is being impacted so that we can address what's the root cause there. Um, instead of just waiting for the complaints to come in, because typically wage theft has been addressed in the city of LA through a complaint-driven process. We wait for you to come to us, you come to us, and we'll go see what the problem is. Um, we're wanting to move more into strategic enforcement where we're not waiting for you to come to us, we're coming to you to address what we believe is an issue based on what we've seen and what we've heard. I think our whole city is set up that way, right? We gotta make the complaint or no, it won't be addressed. <laughs> yeah, no, I but, uh, but okay, yeah, let's have that conversation for sure. Um, I know because for sometimes districts like mine were perceived as the East San Fernando Valley, so a lot of the concentration gets put into District 7 when, uh, and then District 6 gets ignored. And it happens because, you know, Pocoima is a very popular place. But Panorama City needs the support as well. Understood. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Uh, any questions to my left? Okay, coming in fifth place, uh, District 10. Uh, I'm sure you have a lot of questions. I know, right? Is fifth place the better or or worse? Better. I'm sorry, say that again? You know, in the complaint department, District 10 comes in ten, in number five. Is that better or worse? I'm just kidding. That's oh, not oh, my real Oh, 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 oh. Where, 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 where's listed? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry to see that we're on the list, actually. I have another question about employers, businesses mm -hmm. that are uh, egregious with their wage theft. Do, do we amplify that message anywhere besides them, you know, getting noted as violators and having to pay back to their staff the, the uh, stolen wages? What, what other ways do we amplify the message? I'm not... I, I think I understand your question, and the answer right now would be no, we don't. We mm -hmm. don't have a, a, a list of... of sad, sorry, trifling, my word, not Bad yours. actors, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, individuals. Um, interesting enough, you raise that. On the prevailing wage side, we have done that. Mm -hmm. um, and in partnership with, because that's construction, with the Contractor State Licensing Board, we're able to identify all of those contractors who typically do this. So the goal that we have in expanding our partnership is to not just the city of LA, but also the county of Los Angeles other neighboring cities. Let's turn this into a regional approach. So, and I'm not gonna mention a name because I'll probably never hear the end of it, but if contractor or business A constantly is doing this, then let's let that be known. That, that, that's something that I'm not averse to. We wanna be careful how we do it uh, because you could have franchises and not necessarily the corporate or the corporate mm -hmm. and not necessarily the franchise. Um, but there, there are ways that we can and I don't want Danya over there squirming. Be careful, John, what you say. We'd have to talk to the city attorneys out. But there are ways mm -hmm. that we can, and I understand what you're saying. We can celebrate those who do well, and we should. Mm -hmm. Can we warn others about those who don't? Mm -hmm. And that's something that I'm certainly open to having that conversation. But, but, uh, certainly when we have businesses that are, uh, you know, hiring, mm -hmm. like, is there a, a way that we they could be on the, mm, not a great. Well, we, we can be under, under our regulatory, we can't, all we can do is address the offense. Okay. And, 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 and I think, dare I know where you're going, but with the city, contractually we have that power because we have a contract responsibility ordinance. Okay. So we can let other departments know that this particular department who contracted with the city or with the state or the county, they were a bad actor. So take that in consideration before you award a contract to them. But for a business geographically in the city of Los Angeles, there's nothing that we can do to revoke their business license. When I say nothing, is that a conversation we can have with the county? Maybe it is, but right now, we don't have that power to do anything but have them make sure they restitute, and if there are any fines to be paid, pay the fines. Hmm. I, that, that just stimulates a whole bunch of other questions. I just, let me ask you a, con, a contractor, a construction question. Mm -hmm. uh, is that in your purview? Sure. Okay. So let's say, you know, there's a, a construction project. They're doing everything they're supposed to do, prevailing wage, all, all, they did the bargaining, like it's, they're using the unions, all that. They, they work till five o'clock on Friday or six o'clock, whatever time it is. N let's say they're pouring a driveway. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they did all the prep work mm -hmm. till Friday, but they come back on Monday and it's completed because the contractor went in and urged some folks from Home Depot to come finish the work. To, is there anything we can do in that space? So they used the term that's out there, day laborers, Okay. To come and finish the work. Yes. And more than likely, they did not pay them what they should have. And these that, are not that, the people under the contract, right? Understood. That, that, that's wage theft. Right. Now, that would be our office if it happens in the city of Los Angeles. Okay. How to, that, that's where the investigation comes in. That's where the strategic enforcement piece would be very valuable here because it probably was not a one-off. 
this is more than likely a pattern and a practice, then I just, I needed to get it done because a tropical storm was coming and, I, and my workforce was gone, so let me go to a Lowe's or a Home Depot and find people and have them get this done. Um, that, 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 that's probably not the case here. Um, so how can we, how can we um, identify that? Identify that? That's where the relationships come in that the council member was referring to uh, with our worker networks. Mm -hmm. And worker networks, I'm imagining reaching out to uh, areas that they have uh, day laborers and helping them understand and know there's a place where you can go and you can get work and you can be protected and someone can watch over you to make sure that you're not taken advantage of. That, that, that's all that needs to go into this effort to thwart weight theft. Because right now it's easy because people are taking advantage of those that are in need. That's right. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Councilmember Hernandez. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you so much for being here with us today. <laughs> My question is, what is the criteria around what merits a complaint qualified or not? You come to us and you say that I was not paid properly. We just want to check and make sure, okay, do you, do you have anything um, that shows that you worked for this company? Um, we do want to give everyone the benefit of the doubt. So there's two sides to every story. Um, someone coming in and complaining, I'm not saying that you're lying to us, but there could be a number of things that would warrant we can do something about it. Case in point, as I said, in the early days, we had complaints that came to us and the business was located in LA County and not LA City. There's, so there was nothing we can do about the complaint. It may have had merit, but the location was not a good place for us because it wasn't in the city of LA. Um, but we'll ask people, do, did you keep records? And who did you work for? And who's the employer? And then we'll go to the employer. And without mentioning a name or anything like that, we, we will say, okay, are you paying your workers? What are you paying them? And if there's a hesitancy there in answering the question, okay, we like to see your records. So it's, it's, it's a conversation that we will have with the other side of the coin to see whether or not there's something here. And that usually gives us enough to know we need to dig a little deeper. Thank you. Thank questions? You. Yeah, okay. no questions. Well, there's no other questions. I, I just want to, again, you know, thank you so much for giving this amazing report, answering all the questions. Uh, you know, what good time to bring this verbal report back on the day when we're voting on three, uh, you know, pretty mm -hmm. important um, uh, motions. And I think your answers and your insight is probably given us a lot more to think about uh, in really addressing, uh, you know, this very serious issue. So thank you for your time, Mr. Reamer. Uh, is there any action we have to do on this, Mr. Espinosa? No action is required on verbal report. Okay, thank you so much. Well, thank you all for allowing me to come here today. I may have been a little long-winded, but I, I really get passionate about this, and your questions were spot on. Um, I do want to come and, and speak to any of you who will have me uh, to talk more in depth about this issue and to, to hear specifically your concerns so that we can make sure that we incorporate them into our going forward. So thank you, thank you very much. I appreciate the partnership. Thank you so much. We appreciate your passion, Mr. Reamer. Okay, uh, like I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we'd like to take uh, two, three, and four together. Uh, if anybody would like to pull one, please let me know. Uh, otherwise, we can uh, first read it into the record, and then uh, we'll have, I'll have some comments, and we can take a vote. If there's other comments, also open the floor up. Thank God. Thanks. I, item number two is a motion from Council Members Soto Martinez, McOsker, and Harris Dawson relative to an analysis of how the Bureau of Contract Administration's Office of Wage Standards and Civil and Human Rights and Equity Department can better assist and support workers who have been subject to wage, wage standards and civil rights violations in the workplace. Item number three is a motion from Council Members Soto Martinez, McCosker, and um, Harris Dawson um, relative to increasing the authority and capability of the Bureau of Contract Administration's Office of Wage Standards to enforce claims against employers for overtime, break time, late pay, and gratuities.
violations. And the last one, item number four, is a motion from Council Members Smith Gosker, Blumenfield, Hernandez, and Soto Martinez relative to an analysis of current resources used to prosecute wage theft cases and in fulfilling any staffing or resource needs within the office to better effectuate wage theft cases and related matters. Thank you so much, Mr. Espinosa. I think, uh, you know, all these three motions are, are really about trying to make the city better at enforcing all kinds of violations. Some are report backs. Uh, you know, others are, are trying to look at expanding the, 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 the authority of uh, OWS. In particular, the motion two, uh, as folks heard from Mr. Reamer's testimony, uh, usually we just enforce uh, the minimum wage. Uh, but, you know, if, if you've ever, uh, I know a, a councilman Padilla worked on raising the wage uh, in the city of Los Angeles, and I know I've done a lot of work, and I'm sure other folks have been touched by this, uh, including Councilmember Hyatt. Uh, you know, folks oftentimes work off the clock. Uh, they're not given their 10 minute uh, breaks. Uh, you know, they're, they don't get paid overtime, right? They work the ninth hour and they're getting paid just a regular wage. Uh, you know, so many iterations of, of, of wage theft. And I've heard some today that, you know, I, I, I would not have seen it that way, right? The question that the, uh, Ms. Ms. Councilmember Hutt made about the contracting. And so, you know, and, and I think the connection was made uh, very clearly to other public comment why it's important, what, what better, uh, thing to motivate this body than the actual testimony of the workers who are, are facing this. Uh, we know that, uh, you know, it costs Angelinos uh, $1.4 billion every single year. Uh, the average um, wage uh, that is stolen from a worker uh, is about uh, $40 a week. Uh, you know, and as someone who's worked with um, uh, the working folks of the city, uh, that's a huge, that's a difference between being able to pay a bill, uh, put food on the table, uh, or even oftentimes enjoy some of the luxuries uh, of you know being able to take your kids out to the movies or something like that. And uh, you know, cumulatively, as I mentioned, it's, it's uh, 1.4 billion dollars, uh, and it disproportionately affects, as we saw from the testimony, uh, certain industries that happen to be women, uh, happen to be uh, people of color, right? Folks that are more marginalized in, in our society, and that's no coincidence. Uh, we know that uh, fo folks that, are, that have the least amount of power in society are the ones that are uh, mistreated the most, right? And so I think uh, it's not only sort of the just thing to do, but it's also a question of equity and trying to reverse a lot of the uh, systemic issues that uh, unfortunately plague uh, our city, uh, even though, uh, you know, we are a progressive state, right? Progressive city uh, nationwide. Uh, it's unfortunate that we are the wage theft capital of the country. Uh, and so, you know, we need to really look at everything when we're looking at how we're progressing. So uh, I'm excited about this. Uh, I'm excited about uh, passing these, getting them into law. Uh, but also, uh, we know that as when we pass certain laws, uh, it opens up uh, the vision to do more. Uh, it makes us think about things that uh, we didn't see before. Uh, we know that uh, those... Uh, deceitful actors will find ways to continue to cheat people, right? And we have to adjust to their uh, despicable tactics. But this is a, a step in the right direction. Uh, and so I hope uh, my colleagues can join me today in, in voting yes. And, and I obviously, I wanna thank uh, Councilmember McCosker, Councilmember Blumenfield, Councilmember Hernandez, uh, and Councilmember Harris Dawson, who were also part of these motions. Uh, so I hope, uh, I urge your I vote. Uh, any comments for any of my colleagues? Say none. All right, let's call the let's call the vote on this, Mr. Espinosa. Thank you. And this is for items number two, three, and four. And four will be uh, um, if we're voting to concur with the approval of the um, the personnel audits and hiring committee that's also heard this item pr previously. Mm -hmm. um, Council Member Soto Martinez. Aye. Council Member Hutt. Aye. Council Member Hernandez. Councilmember Padilla? Aye. And Councilmember Rodriguez is absent, so that's four ayes, and these three items are approved. Thank you so much, Mr. Espinosa. Do we have any other items to discuss today? No, the desk is clear. Nope. My favorite words. Happy Friday, everyone. I hope yeah. you enjoy El Grito, and as always, please have a wonderful and safe weekend.